Welcome to Discovering Nutrition with Chronometer. I'm your host and community marketing manager, Elisa, and today I'm jazzed to have on guest Robert Yang. Rob has two decades of experience as an integrative practitioner. He specializes in digestive wellness, hormone restoration, and performance enhancement. He is an internationally sought after presenter on the topics of nutrition, gut health, and performance enhancement. He's an advisory board member for the Titleist Performance Institute and the National Pitching Association. He consults with elite professionals athletes from the X Games, NFL, MLB, AVP, PGA, LPGA, and European Tour. Robert has appeared in numerous radio and television segments such as the Golf Channel, and he's been published in magazines like Golf Digest, Men's Fitness, and Muscle and Fitness. He's also the author of Hole in One Nutrition, A Guide to Fueling Better Golf. In this episode, we sit down with Rob to discuss the connection between diet and energy and how you can maximize your diet to feel your best. We also dive into why optimizing sleep and gut health are key factors to thriving too. As always, this podcast is for general purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including getting medical advice. The use of information from this podcast is at the user's own risk and is not to be substituted for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. I am very excited to get this one going. I cannot wait to pick his brain on this. I have so many questions. Let's get started. How do you know Don? Oh my goodness. I think it's probably 2004 uh, is when we first met. So he, we met over at the Tylus Performance Institute in Oceanside. So okay. I don't know if you're ever TPI for short, but what they basically do is we educate golfers, uh, obviously in terms of mm-hmm. exercise, fitness, nutrition, uh, and then also there's an educational track. So basically what it is, is we have a track for fitness professionals, for medical, uh, if you're a chiropractor, physical therapist, orthopedic surgeon, golf coach, and then we also have a junior program. So amazing. Yeah. So I met Don way back when we started in 2004 and we just kept in touch. I would go out to New York, I'd be teaching or doing something. And, you know, he had drive for 95 at the time. So I'd go visit, hang out, train, talk shop, that sort of thing. So it's been good. He's he's become a really good friend over the last couple of years. Yeah, he's such such a great guy. I actually, through Chronometer, went to DonCon the last two years. Okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the com- his, his community is just so lovely. Like I, I went in as a stranger and they all know each other from like being online, right? Oh, right. And I'm yeah. like, how is this going to be for me? But it was honestly incredible and everyone was so welcoming. So this year it felt like going to see family. It was like a family reunion. So, oh, so it sounds like the same, the same people it's already. Like yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah cool. They do for, for the most part. Like I think yeah. that there was like 30 people that because he did two weeks, 30 people that I knew that were week one. So it was incredible. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so for this month's theme, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Chronometer, are you? I am. Uh, I mean, funny enough, Dom was the one who introduced me. So Rob, <laughs> and I, I, I just chuckled inside because your Chronometer, and I was like, Chronometer, Chronometer. So I wasn't know how to how to pronounce it, but I am aware of of, of the app for sure. I, I've used it a number of times for sure. Yeah. So you can say whatever you want. Our CEO, uh, I think he's on the best authority and he like flips back and forth. People say chronometer, chronometer. I say chronometer. Aaron originally invented it for the cron diet, like calorie restriction for optimum nutrition. And that's where it came from. So it used to actually be like cron dash O meter. And I've worked here for long enough that I remember when it was called that. (laughs) So so for me, for me, that is just chronometer, you know, but so for this month, we typically do themed topics. This month is energy in terms of obviously like having it and maximizing for it. So a lot of my questions are kind of about like diets and energy or that kind of thing. But I do just have general nutrition questions as well, because you have your master's in nutrition, correct? Correct. That is amazing. Where did you go to school? Tell me a little bit about your background. Yeah. So I went to the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut. So they have a human nutrition program of the, I think he's the 
head of education, but uh, uh, Dr. David Brady. So I highly respect some of his work and he's done a lot of research. And so he's fairly high up in the functional medicine sort of industry in that part of the education. So I got my master's from there and I've always had uh, an interest in nutrition, whether it was the performance side. And so I have a practice that's kind of a, a bit interesting in the sense that I do you know, nutrition, but then depends on what hat I'm wearing. So sometimes I'm hired to be a strength coach as well. So sometimes I take the reins and I'm in charge of an athlete's nutrition uh, and exercise program. And then other times there might be a coach or there might be uh, another, you know, strength and conditioning coach or Don says, Hey, this person has some gut issues, Rob, can you help them out? I need you to consult with them. So it just kind of depends on what my roles are. I have done my homework on you. I've listened to a couple uh, podcasts that you've been a guest on, and I know that you wrote a book about nutrition yeah. for golfers specifically. Yeah, whole in one nutrition, and uh, you know it, it's interesting because you know a lot of my colleagues like Don and you know a bunch of people have performed better and conferences. They tell me, "Hey, Rob, you need to rename the book. This will help a lot of different people, not just golfers." Mm-hmm. So, so obviously, we'll probably talk about. It energy and some of the principles that I advocate. Um, We'll probably talk about that today. Yeah, absolutely. I found it very interesting that it's a very niche market to just focus on nutrition for golfers. But it's funny because I actually watched Full Swing on Netflix and like golfers now are training so differently like one of my favorite movies is is happy gilmore and just Uh like thinking back to golfing like back when that was produced you know like there weren't necessarily people that were training and watching their nutrition and working out to golf and then watching that that series i was like whoa they they have upped their game for sure no pun intended when it comes to lifestyle i mean even when I first started, you know, as a nutritionist over at Titleist, I mean, you know, it was hot dog and a beer at the turn. And, <laughs> you know, that was nutrition pretty much. But that, I mean, that was probably one of the reasons why, you know, I targeted that golf site. Because really, I mean, I think there was one, one book, I think, on nutrition. It was sort of a manual booklet. It wasn't even a book. And so there's a lot of research, but I've also got a lot of experience just working with you know, the range from an amateur player all the way to the PGA, LPGA player. So I think there's lots of things that golfers need to think about if they want to play well. And I think that's true for anything now. I think that we're starting to understand how much our diets, and when I say diet, I just mean diet in the true sense that it was intended, just what we're eating that is actually playing a role in absolutely everything. So it's really interesting. One of the questions I had for you just on a personal level, I do, I run our social media accounts at Coronameter. And now more than ever, I feel like there's so much controversy about Mm. different diets. You know, I know there's always been like different camps, people who eat carbs. Obviously there's like a large ketogenic population of people that use our app. How does one of our users filter information to get the truth in today's time when there's internet articles, people are cherry picking different studies, you know, like there's just so much information. How do we know what's true and what's not? It's a very good question because oftentimes it can just, you know, touch of the finger and you have all this information. And it sometimes for a lot of people is paralysis by analysis. It just gets stuck and then, well, I don't know who to leave, so I'm just going to do whatever. That's the worst case scenario. But I I think uh, there is something to an individual. So in particular, biochemical individuality. So if you look at, you know, William's book, Biochemical Individuality, I believe it was like one person to another person, their need for magnesium can, you know, be as, as different as like tenfold, you know, in terms of the amount of magnesium that one person needs over another. So I think that's where you know, some assessment can be really helpful. So that's where uh, oftentimes blood work can be quite helpful to guide an individual. So if, you know, they are a person that's, you know, sort of a dieter and they want to try different diets and see what's really optimal for them, then they can start to dive into some blood work and figure out, okay, like, how is this affecting my blood sugar over time? 
Where is my hemoglobin A1C? Where is you know, my glycogen serum proteins? You know, is my blood sugar too high or is it too low? Is someone becoming more of a, you know, functional hypoglycemic? I see that very often these days. So if that's the case, and sometimes you may not be able to do ketogenic, you know, if you want to, or you may not be able to do an intermittent fasting. I think that's probably the biggest issue that I see just because people are touting intermittent fasting or time restricted eating, however you want to <laughs> coin the terminology, but essentially most people know IF intermittent fasting. And a lot of people are doing it, not knowing that it's long-term, it's actually making them worse and they're not getting the results they want. So that's where you have to be careful. And I think so for individual, I think that's where blood work can come into play to help guide them in that process. Short of doing blood work, could people just do trial and error? Like I remember when I started working here, I didn't really know a lot about the ketogenic diet. I think it was called the Atkins diet when I was younger, like the low carb, you know? Right, right. And so I'm like, I should try this to see why our users care so much about accurate carb intake. So I did the ketogenic diet, used different uh, tools to make sure I was actually in ketosis. And I just didn't feel very good. <laughs> so is there something to be said just for your own body's feedback? Or would you recommend people going and actually getting blood testing? I mean, I think the, the best way would be to get some blood work first before you start anything. But you know, my experience, most people don't are not willing to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Or the problem it then becomes, you know, they'll oftentimes it's it's a daily cases where someone says, Hey, Rob, I want to set an appointment with you. And I say, okay, well, we'll probably need to run some kind of blood work on you. And they go, Oh, my doctor ran blood work on me. And then, you know, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, it's the bare minimum. It's, you know, maybe a blood glucose, a CBC, complete blood count, and a comprehensive met metabolic panel or profile. And that's pretty much it. So you're just looking to see, oh, are they have a chronic infection or is there something majorly going on? And that doesn't really do too much to probably most of the listeners that are, you know, going to be listening to this podcast or want different information. But I mean, you know, there's sort of professional diaries where they just, they want to try everything that comes out, whether it's carnivore or ketogenic or, you know, a vegan plan or whatever it is. So, but I, I think for most people, I think, you know, blood work is a good way to go just before you start to make some major changes. What do you think is the best diet? Obviously, there's different factors. A lot of people say the best diet is one that you can adhere to. But from a nutritional standpoint, what is the best breakdown of carbohydrates or just the best different food sources in your opinion? Yeah, my opinion, I would say I, you know, when I wrote the whole in one nutrition book, I wanted to think of some uh, principle that was very easy to remember because when I, <laughs> funny story, I first started working with golfers. And so there were some big wigs coming through some of these programs because they would actually go and, you know, they pay, you know, thousands of thousands of dollars to take analyzed uh, with all these different 3D analysis and all, all these kinds of technologies. And um, we had, I think, uh, someone from Jim Beam or something like that come. And I said, you know, alcohol, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol. And, you know, it does this and this <laughs> and that. And I learned real quickly that uh, golfers were very hesitant to change their nutrition unless it let them hit the ball another 10 or 15 yards. Um, <laughs> so that whole process of writing whole in nutrition, I thought, okay, I, I got to think of something that's really basic and easy to remember. So I've always said uh, your BFF, sure, your best friend forever for controlling blood sugar is PFF. And so the PFF stands for protein, fats, and fiber. So I tell people, look, you know, protein, the word, Latin word is of primary importance. So that's probably the number one food I would tell people, look, you probably just should look for some kind of protein on your plate. Um, second thing is going to be fiber. So some type of uh, vegetable or fruit. Um, and then the third would be fat. And all those on their own really help to stabilize blood sugar. And then also combining together is like a one plus one plus one equals five effect. You get a synergistic effect. Now, I know some people, they'll read the book and they'll say, oh, well, that's just an Atkins approach. Yeah, I mean, you could say it can, it's an Atkins approach. And again, this is principle-based. It's just a foundation principle of a starting point of where someone should start. So ideally, you want to start there. And then if you 
for example, like you had felt, you know, really bad that you were in ketosis. Well, at that point, okay, then you would modify and change some things and say, okay, at this point, um, I'm not really doing very well on, and this is where you can use chronometer to obviously look at your proteins, your fats and your carbohydrates, and then you can kind of monitor from there. But for the most part, I try to people get people to just think about a principle first, because some people, you know, they, some people don't want to count calories. Some people don't want to be on that all the time. Sometimes I have to educate people and say, look, you need to do something at this point. So you can kind of get a starting point, but that would be probably the base and foundation of where I would start someone off at is, you know, decent amount of protein, obviously protein does have some fat. So that may have to, you know, you can modify and change that and then plenty of vegetables and then adding fruit in there. Um, that, that, and that's not always the case, you know, for some people I tell them you don't need to do that. You know, I have a young son who's, you know, 18 kind of professional surfing, pursuing that. And he's, you know, surfing six to eight hours a day, training an hour a day, and he can't keep on weight. <laughs> so mm-hmm. for something like that, I wouldn't even recommend something like that. You know, it would be obviously they'd have to eat a decent amount of carbohydrates and that sort of thing. But I would say for the general population type, person, that's probably a good starting point. And then you can kind of, you know, titrate up and down from there. How does a diet affect our energy levels throughout the day? And what's the best way that we could maximize our diet to to maintain energy levels? I would say the the most important thing is to really think about sort of the someone's heartbeat. So I was telling a young athlete this morning, I said, you know how you see a movie and someone they have you know, their heart hooked up to a monitor and you see it go up and down and all of a sudden they flatlines. You're like, oh my God, they're going to die. They're flatlining. Well, I just tell people, look, we want that effect with blood sugar essentially. So for the majority of the day, not all the time, 100% of the time, but the majority of the day, we want blood sugar to get up and then we relatively want it to stay up and sort of level. I just tell people we want to avoid the roller coaster of blood sugar. Although it's fun to be on a roller coaster, not in the context of your blood sugar. Because as you go from a high point and then you drop down, because the higher the peak, the deeper the valley, that's when you're, it's a very stressful state to your system. And so I tell people, look, it doesn't matter if you have SIBO and you have leaky gut, or if you want to balance out your hormones and you've got menopausal symptoms, this is one of the key foundations of where you really have to stabilize blood sugar, because that's one thing that you're in control of. We're not in control of obviously stressors from our life and death in the family and you know stress at work from our boss and all the other things, but we are in control of what we can put on our body. So that's a very powerful tool that people can use, whatever their goal is or whatever they're struggling with. How does somebody know what their blood sugar levels are doing? Well, so there's a couple of ways sort of to monitor. Obviously, you could tack on a CGM. So you can do, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, continuous glucose monitor. I personally don't have my clients do that because um, I think it might be too much for most people to do that. Um, But if people want to do that, I'm fine if you want to do that. I would say one of the hands down sort of symptomology that you can use is that how you feel an hour after eating a meal. So oftentimes when I'm interviewing a person, And I always ask them, how's your energy? And I qualify that and say, well, how's your energy when you want to wake up? So are you like (laughs) pressing the snooze bar 15 times and you want that extra five minutes of sleep or are you up and out of bed? And then two is how do you feel after eating meals? So I typically look, the only thing that you should feel different after eating a meal is you're just not hungry anymore. If you feel a massive amount of energy, then possibly there's unstable blood sugar. If you feel tired and sleepy after a meal, then you have issues with your blood sugar. So those are two key principles that people can key off of that. If you notice, man, I'm just so energetic after eating, that's not good either. Either um, That means maybe you didn't do a good job earlier in the day. Um, or obviously, if you're falling asleep an hour or so after eating, then that's an issue as well. Is there a time interval that would help us maintain our blood sugar level? Should we be eating every X amount of hours or is it more what we're eating that would impact the blood sugar? I think it's both. So oftentimes, and and obviously this is a whole nother discrepancy argument. Oh, you should eat six meals a day. Oh no, you should only eat three times a day, right? Like people have these arguments of, 
oh, we evolved this way. So you shouldn't eat, you know, at appropriate times. You should be sporadic all the time. And I mean, you have the whole spectrum of what people are recommending. And for me as, as a practitioner, that's where blood work can help guide me to in a sense of where I can help people and say, look, I think you should eat breakfast, a snack, lunch, snack, and dinner. So for instance, a person may come in after they've I've run a functional blood panel. So this is a customized panel that I have come up with. And we'll run a fasting glucose, we'll run a hemoglobin A1C, we'll run glycase serum protein, and we'll also run a fasting insulin. And sometimes in those cases, those things sort of check out. So their fasting glucose is like a 91, and then their hemoglobin A1C is like a 5.2. Normal functional range is between a 5, 5.5. You know, and then, you know, insulin is like a six. So you're like, oh, their blood sugar is pretty good. But another marker I run is called LDH, which stands for lactate dehydrogenase. And that one can indicate, tell us if they're possibly a functional or a progressive hypoglycemic. So oftentimes the functional range is like 160 to 180. And oftentimes I've been getting people in the 120s, 140s, um, that those kinds of things. And those are the ones that are typically, God, I feel so tired after I eat. Like an hour and a half goes by and I'm like, oh my God, I want to take a nap. So that's where I alluded to earlier where lab work can be quite helpful. And so those are the type of people that I'll say, look, you are the type of person you're trying to intermittent fast and you're, you're not eating through the morning and then your energy levels all over the place. Or they are slight depressed or they have anxiety or they have other things going on. And those are clearly signs of a lack of controlled blood sugar as, as a base foundation that we have to address first. Obviously, there could be other issues involved, but I like to rule out the basic foundational principles first, the low-hanging fruit at that point. So you're saying, obviously, it's very ind individualistic as to how often we should actually be eating what about what we're eating? Should we be trying to incorporate, as you said, the the protein and the fiber and the fat at every meal? Like what are the implications of eating cake after dinner? Is that going to skyrocket our blood sugar? Yeah, th that's a really good question. So, you know, oftentimes people will say, oh, Rob, you don't like carbs. Like you you hate carbs. And I said, no, I don't. I don't hate carbs. I just, uh, in my opinion, I feel... And obviously we're talking in, you know, in generalities, but for most people, they'll do fairly well eating PFF, protein, fats, and fiber. But in the context of exercise, I think the carbohydrate take is probably more activity dependent. So if a person, they can train, I don't know, 20 minutes on a Peloton twice a week, and the rest of the time they're sitting in a chair because they have sedentary work and they can't be active and they can't, they don't have a stand-up desk or anything like that. Then in that context, I'm not going to probably put them on a lot of starch carbohydrates, things to impact their blood sugar to go up and down. Now, if you have someone who trains once a day, um, they're very active or they have a sport, then at that point, I'll say, look, I want you to sandwich your workout with some carbohydrates, whether it's your rice or your potatoes or your fruit or whatever you want to do, your oats, whatever your favorite is. Um, at that point, then uh, we really want to try to maximize your energy during a workout. And that, and we can go into that, but everybody's individual in that aspect, whether they like their carbs before or after, or they do better with both. But I did want to talk about what you had talked about. If you had, you know, some chocolate clay, you know, at, at, the, at the end of the night after dinner, it does impact you. So obviously if you just have a chocolate cake by itself, that's probably the worst case scenario because you have nothing to slow it down. Obviously you've had a, a decent dinner of some, you know, some fish and some vegetables and you know, some fats with it or something, then obviously you combine that with the cake and then it releases your blood sugar a bit slower. But if you do have a bunch of sugar or even alcohol, um, that does put you on that roller coaster blood sugar. And so ideally, that's probably not ideal towards the end of the evening to a certain degree. The reason, only reason why I say that is because Whenever you, if you spike your blood sugar too much, and it could be something like wine, alcohol, people have two glasses of wine uh, towards the end of the evening to relax. And the problem with that is that you spike the blood sugar so much that it ends up dropping. And so, yes, you know, people say, oh, well, wine's great because I drink it and I feel relaxed. And then I fall asleep like an hour and a half, two hours later. The problem is once the blood sugar plummets and drops even lower, 
then the body goes, whoa, blood sugar is too low. So the body starts producing cortisol. Um, obviously, cortisol is one of our stress hormones, but the root name of cortisol used to be glucocorticoid. So that means it's the hormone of blood sugar control. So one of its primary jobs in the body is to raise blood sugar. The problem is that when cortisol level goes up in the evening, it should be at its lowest point. So now you're screwing around with hormones. So because cortisol is high, melatonin can't be produced. Melatonin is low. And so that's why people struggle to either stay asleep or fall asleep because now they're driving up their cortisol levels too high because they're not controlling their blood sugar. So that's where there's sort of that um, interaction of blood sugar and then even with hormonal control and then affecting sleep down the road. I can't believe I didn't know this because I feel like I've learned a lot about nutrition since I started working here, but I had no idea that alcohol affected blood sugar at all. Yeah, I mean, that's just one aspect. I mean, I could go into more, but some people might get upset after they listen to the podcast if they like their wine. <laughs> I don't drink alcohol, so maybe that's why I haven't like delved into oh, that okay, more. Yeah. That is shocking to me, but it does make sense. That being said, I do have a sweet tooth and absolutely last night after dinner had uh, pie and ice cream. So I'm probably not necessarily doing all the right things either. But that's okay. One I mean, of the things... Yeah, I, I mean, I don't... I tell people, look, I mean, if you eat 80% of the time correctly, I mean, you're you're fine, you know? That's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I like to consider myself very active. One of the things that I've personally noticed is, and I'm interested in what you said about like sandwiching carbs around a workout, because I do work out quite a bit. And I've never really, like I've talked to, we have a nutrition scientist on staff. Her name is Karen and, and she's amazing. And I was asking about like timing for, for the best workout that I can possibly have. Like, you know, I want to be able to push. And we're talking about like fueling beforehand. When is the optimal time? Because I've noticed sometimes if I don't eat enough beforehand, when I'm done like an intense mountain bike ride or something, I want to eat my whole pantry. Right, <laughs> like right. I literally just want instant, like all I crave is sugary things. I'm sure because my, my blood sugar is just, I just probably tanked it. So right. how can I prevent that? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, there's a lot of variables that come into play. So one is, is that first thing in the morning or have you had several meals before that? So all those things factor in. In your situation, are you typically a morning you know, mountain biker or afternoon? I've noticed that my energy as a rule is better when I've been well fed throughout the day, when mm. I have some calories in me. Right. So I usually go in the afternoon or even the evening. I see. Yeah. So I would say in that case is that's where, you know, um, you could potentially play around with protein sources, you know, before training uh, or like a mountain biking session. Um, obviously, it depends on the the volume and duration or if you're going to do high intensity intervals. And, you know, then we're looking at gastric emptying. Um, so you may not be able to do that much protein. But oftentimes when an athlete is so starving like they just want to eat the whole refrigerator after they train that's when i start to look into okay what is your food intake maybe before training so sometimes we might need to play around with your protein intake and possibly fat intake just enough where it doesn't affect your ability to exercise but where we can try to keep your blood sugar a little more stable a little longer for instance just because i you know i'm part of the advisory board for tpi one of the things that I'm always trying to figure out with golfers is how do we keep their blood sugar stabilized for a long period of time? Because those guys have to go out there and they tee off at eight and they have to play for four and a half hours, maybe five if they've got a slow group. Um, and then even sometimes the collegiate players they have to play 36 in a day. So it can be difficult at times, but that's where I tell some of these guys, look, you may have to maybe push your eating a little more. Like you might have to eat more, a couple more pieces of bacon, or if you like avocado, instead of doing half avocado, maybe do whole avocado and experiment with that with a little bit of fat intake. Because what that does is it slow down, slows down the digestive process. You know, like, so for example, a cyclist, they're going to go on a century ride and, you know, you know, intensity can't be high. Well, then you could probably maybe protein and fat load them a little more. Whereas if they're just mm -hmm. going to go for more sprints for, you know, a, an hour and a half or two hours, and they're going to do intervals on hills, then at that point, you may not be able to do something like that. But that's the way that I would 
try to work around a particular athlete to to try to uh, modify with their food. And then the other option is I like to use a lot of amino acids during training. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, if you can use individual amino acids, one of the side sort of, I guess it's a benefit or sometimes it's a detriment, but I noticed that it decreases the appetite quite a bit. So if you can use high amounts of branch amino acids or essential amino acids, that can be quite helpful to stave off hunger because that's one of the things that I'm also trying to to modify for a particular player because oftentimes if they're hungry on the course all the time, they're just distracted and they're like, okay, what am I going to eat when I'm finishing around my round where they be actually should be focusing on, you know, their approach shot and what they're doing as they're playing for four to five hours. I think it's so interesting because I'm at maintenance calories uh, myself and I've just never really dabbled around with meal timing and working out a lot of the time I'll get to the end of the day and I'll be like, wow, I did an hour and a half bike ride in the mountains. You know, it's like interval I'm doing cross country. So I'm doing lots of climbing and then I'll go run my dog for 10 kilometers. And then I'm like, at the end of the day, I'm like, I have to eat everything. So I have more energy tomorrow because I'm woefully under my calories. So that's actually something I'm going to pay attention to now, I think is when I, when I'm anticipating doing some bigger, bigger workouts, maybe having more protein or fat yeah. beforehand. Yeah. That, that would be one thing to work on. And then the, the other thing would be working on salt intake too. So that would be something mm-hmm. that you focus on a tremendous amount, but obviously try to do one variable at a time to see how you respond. And then you go, okay, that protein intake definitely did help. All right. Add that in there, put that in my pocket and then, okay, let's play around with maybe some different fat intake. Oh, that didn't work out. So then, okay, they throw that out and then play with around with the salt. I think um, the biggest mistake I see people make is they just do too many things all at once because they, you know, and and that's the dysfunction of social media (laughs) where people hear so many different things. And, you know, I, I tell people, look, I need you to stop looking on Dr. Google and I just need you to focus on what I want you to do right now. Like these are the, the basic things. And they're not, they're not so sexy, but we need to focus on these things first before we get to the shiny bells and whistles. <laughs> well, I feel like in my job here at Chronometer being the podcast host, I had Rob Wolf on last year when we were talking about hydration and right. he was talking to me about electrolyte intake because I honestly only at that point really thought hydration was about water. And I was running a marathon a month then. And he's like, how's your, how's your salt intake? And I'm like, I have no idea. And then he's like, salt your next marathon. And my energy level was completely different. I'm like, wow. So it's, it's great for me to get to, to learn all, all these things. Hopefully our users get to too, and then implement them. One question I do have, and I'm seeing this more and more, more and more energy drinks are coming out. Mm. what is the effect of us having all of these Red Bulls, Monsters? Obviously, they have caffeine, which would, you tell me, give us more energy. Like, what are these energy drinks really doing for us? Well, I mean, they do give you a false sense of energy. Um, I, I don't have a problem with someone using them, but using them very intelligently. You know, I, I don't train at a regular gym. I very rarely do. Uh, my wife likes to train at like 24 hour fitness near us. So I'll once in a while go train with her. And um, it's interesting because I, I don't like training with music. So I know some people have to have their headphones and their uh, Air, AirPods, whatever you want to call them. But I don't like training with music. And I and people are like, you're so weird. Like my, my, my sons always make fun of dad. You don't want us to play music in your studio. I go, that's right. Cause I don't want you to play music. I want you to focus on what you're doing. That's all another story. But anyways, I get to hear different conversations and I hear these guys, I'm just resting. I hear these guys talk, Oh man, that, that pre-workout man is so awesome. And, and then one other guy's like, Oh, but man, if I, if I don't have that pre-workout, oh, I, I feel kind of depressed. And so this is the problem. And so I've done a lot of different presentations in the States and like overseas in Australia about coffee, caffeine intake. And so I'd usually tell people the difference is, are you thriving using coffee or caffeine or are you surviving? So if you're thriving and you're able to use it to help focus and concentration, you know, concentration for your round of golf or, you know, for, you know, giving you some energy during a training session, that's fine. But 
if people have to have it to train, that's a whole nother ball game. So that's where you have to be careful with um, a lot of these energy drinks. I tell people, look, one thing you got to definitely do is one, make sure your water intake is really, really good. So half your body weight in ounces of water per day. And first thing in the morning, what's really critical is drink 25% of your total intake first thing right when you get up. So literally you get up, go to the bathroom, and then I'm straight to the kitchen and I do 25% uh, of my total intake with a teaspoon of salt, unrefined sea salt. Get that in there first. And oftentimes it sounds so simple, but just doing that, I've had so many people come up at conferences. I, I, it kind of baffles me sometimes, but they're like, bro, that was such a game changer. I'm like, well, what, what did it do? I'm like, I'm curious to know what it did. He goes, I used to do three energy drinks a day. I just do one now. Ever since I just increased my water and did the salt you told me to do. It's like, I'm like, okay, proof is in the pudding. So that's where I think people are missing the boat on hydration. So that's where I tell people, look, you know, you need to hydrate first thing in the morning before you get coffee, your Red Bull, at least do that and then see what happens to your caffeine intake. And oftentimes, in most cases, it does reduce their, their caffeine usage because they're hydrating right away. Because most people don't realize when you sleep for seven, eight hours, you are losing water just by respirating. Mm -hmm. uh, some people sweat more than others. Um, some people pee, they don't even realize they go back to bed. And so it's called insensible fluid loss. And so that happens when you're sleeping. So you wake up in a dehydrated state. And so that hydration process starts with water and starts with salt. So that's where that can be a very powerful tool for, for many people. And they'll naturally notice that, oh man, I don't feel like I need to grab the extra coffee or I don't need the extra caffeine, which, you know, if they normally do it at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, they're probably going to sleep better because they don't have caffeine uh, in their system when they try to go to bed. I actually just started doing exactly what you're recommending. Hydration month was last month and I interviewed yeah. Dr. Dana Cohen. She wrote, she co-authored a book called Quench and yeah. everyone is saying the same thing, you know, like have water, have salt. And it's just almost too easy. <laughs> like, Right, right. You know, and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I like committing to, I read the book and I like committing to implementing the changes. And I was like, this is really good. And it's just the most simple thing, but people are just like, maybe a little bit lazy about it, which is crazy. When you think about people are willing to go to the gym for an hour, track their nutrition every day, like wow. honestly, just wake up and have some water and salt. I, I put a little bit of lime juice in there for a little bit of flavor too, but it honestly made a really big difference for me. Yeah. And, and it's, it's that, or like you said earlier, when we first started chatting that uh, hydration is not just water, but it's also the salt and electrolytes. So oftentimes one of the problems I see within the fitness industry is, um, and, and it goes to more of the bodybuilders, fitness, you know, women and fitness guys, you know, they're drinking gallons of water a day and, um, you know, their coaches tell them no, no salt, like don't drink any salt or in worst case scenario, they, they make them drink distilled water and you have a 120 pound female, five, two petite. And she's drinking a gallon of water a day. I go, well, no wonder you're having kind of headaches when you shouldn't. And you're feeling lightheaded because you already have low blood pressure and you're just making it worse. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, that's the case um, in, in many scenarios. Just those little things. But I don't think that people know that, that that's just one thing that needs to get out there more. I don't think, you know, as someone who sees a lot of user journeys, like we just hit 8 million users last weekend, which is so huge. And I think like most people do only think that water is hydration and it is a lot more than that. And it does really impact your energy levels. That That's what I'm finding anyway, since I've started having the salt with the water and a little bit of lime in the morning, I'm not feeling as like 2 p.m. crashy anymore. And I think it's just because I just wasn't having enough salt. I'm just not someone that typically has foods high in sodium. So it's interesting. One of the things that we talked about just very briefly is sleep. How crucial is sleep when determining our energy levels for the next day? I would say sleep is probably the underutilized tool that people do not uh, emphasize enough. I'll admit, like my younger years, abused it. I would, you know, wake up early, sleep late, 
I'm like, oh, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to surf two hours a day. I'll train, you know, 45 minutes at night. I'll be fine. But then I would chronically get, you know, signs, sinus things get cold and, and so forth. Um, you know, a third of your life should be spent sleeping essentially. And so it has a huge impact, far reaching effects from everything from, you know, gut health. So that's something that I always am working with. I guess I just fell into it where I do a lot of lab testing, stool testing. So I ended up helping out a lot of people with gut issues. And so they refer me to other people. And so it kind of has just been a big part of my practice. And one of the big aspects of, for people uh, in healing their gut is sleep because uh, they show hands down when you actually deprive people of sleep, you end up, one, you change their gut diversity. We know gut diversity over the long haul is important for gut health, but then you're also changing the environment as well. So for example, I, I tell people, you know, there, there are some studies sort of conflict based on rat and human studies. And one of the biggest differences is that with um, the rat studies, when they sleep deprive them, it's like, how do you sleep deprive a rat? Well, the way that they do it, they put them on a rotating drum. So they make them walk for 20 hours and then they let them sleep for four hours. But the, the how they do that is if they fall off the drum, they, they are in a pool of water. <laughs> so that's kind of stressful if you think about it. But then with the humans, yes. <laughs> what they do the humans is they let them stay up all night. They, they talk to the, the people that are monitoring them. They read a lot of read books, watch video, play video games and do all these other things. So it's a very stress-free environment. So that's why in some of the, you know, the studies that don't show changes in gut diversity and so forth in the humans, it's because the environment is very, very nice and conducive. But, you know, you know, back in the days when we we're at university and you're studying for exams and you haven't studied all semester, you're cramming for <laughs> 10 days you know, you sleep for four or five hours a night and that in itself changes the gut microbiome. And then two, your quality of sleep is not very good. Volume of sleep is not very good. Now you interact with hormones. So we know that your ghrelin, which is your appetite hormone, it increases when you don't have enough sleep. So now you get the munchies and then you're not meal prepping that sort of thing because you're studying like mad. So then now you're eating probably junk food, fast food, and processed foods and you and you tend to choose a lot of the comfort foods when you're stressed and you don't sleep enough so that's the other factor and then that creates a whole snowball vicious effect of gut inflammation you know you don't poop or you got diarrhea constipation and you create this whole sort of vicious cycle of gut issues so a lot of people they're fine during the exams and then they're so full let down like oh my god i can't pass everything great and then boom they got all of these kinds of gut issues after uh, because they've kind of hammered it for, you know, so long with lack of sleep, you know, bad food, inflammatory foods, that sort of thing. And so that's where sleep can really make a massive difference in someone's recovery over time, whether it's gut in the context of gut or even with uh, hormonal issues as well. I think that a lot of my friends probably think that I'm boring because I'm like, I need to get home and sleep <laughs> instead of staying up till two in the morning. But at the end of the day, it has had a huge implication. I want, I've worn an aura ring for years and having like real like feedback about what a five hour sleep does to you versus, you know, seven or eight definitely gets me in bed earlier. I love how much you talk about gut health, though, too, because that's something I've been so interested in. If someone is eating something that is negatively impacting their gut health, is that going to have a role as well in like energy depletion? Like what what are the ramifications of eating something that's kind of blowing up your guts? Yeah, so uh, basically, um, there's some direct and indirect effects. So um, oftentimes, if they're potentially eating foods that is inflammatory to their system, then what ends up happening is that that in itself becomes very uh, inflammatory in the sense that it's one avenue of where when you're eating something that's inflammatory, it has a possibility of, of impacting the gut and making it leaky. So people go, well, you know, leaky gut, what's the big deal? You know, you have a gut that's leaky. Well, it's sort of the unverified VIP pass of anything that you've eaten to go straight into the bloodstream. So the bloodstream is very sacred territory. 
<laughs> um, so that's why you have a gut lining that's very protective. And so you have these tight junctions that are very close and should be tight. But oftentimes when it gets inflamed, these tight junctions open up and then you have things that go from your small intestine of what you've consumed and eaten that go straight into the bloodstream. And they're, they're not going to verify passageways. Um, and so what ends up happening is that causes a massive inflammatory response uh, within the system. It doesn't know the difference between, you know, wild salmon and kale and some organic broccoli and organic, you know, brown rice. It just knows that that's not supposed to be in the blood. So it attacks itself and attacks those things as invaders. And that's a sort of false alarm. And so now a lot of the energy resources are spent to deal with that. And so that's where energy is, is wasted essentially, because the body's always trying to keep in check the inflammation, cytokines and all these kinds of things. Um, and that's when that can become a massive problem just by the foods that they're potentially eating that could be uh, inflammatory to the intestinal tract. Um, and then once that goes systemic, well, then now it affects everything from liver function. So oftentimes there's people that have fatty liver and they don't drink alcohol. They don't drink tons of soda or juices or anything. They're like, I don't understand why I have a fatty liver. And then you find out they have uh, an overgrowth of bacteria or they have gut issues going on. And so a lot of these potential gut issues have the capacity to affect someone's energy. The way I try to explain to someone is we just talked about sleep, right? We said, well, you know, sleep matters. Like if you get five hours of sleep, that's not good. But sleep, it's it's what I call Q squared. It's quality and quantity. They both matter. I mean, even if you lie in bed for 10 hours, if you're only getting good five hours of sleep, you're going to feel tired the next day. And where gut issues play into affecting sleep is that if someone has SIBO, right? You've heard that a lot, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Well, they're overgrowing. And so they have the potential to cause leaky gut. And so the body's always trying to, again, rectify, normalize, you know, create a homeostatic um, environment. And so one of the way the body deals with that is to mobilize the immune system. And what I find is that people with SIBO or CIFO or a parasite, whichever, they find that they are eating very well, stabilizing their blood sugar, but they can't stay asleep or their sleep quality is very, very bad. And oftentimes it's the body's just actively trying to get rid of the overgrowth at night when you're sleeping. And then that affects somebody's sleep. And obviously that affects someone's energy during the day. So oftentimes, yes, we need their sleep to improve, but taking melatonin is probably not going to help. It's probably other things up the chain uh, that need to be addressed and sometimes it's in the gut. And so oftentimes I see people sleep improve over time, not overnight, but um, as their gut health improves and their sleep improves over time. This is such like a harmonious balance that we're trying to maintain all the time. When you're right. talking about inflammatory foods, is mm -hmm. that specific to an individual or are there foods that across the board will cause issues for some people? Or for um, most people, yeah. it, it is, uh, it can be individual. That's why testing can be very helpful. I would say just testing hundreds and hundreds of people, I would say probably the top four that are usually in the mix are probably going to be eggs, um, probably dairy, uh, gluten, and then corn will probably be up there. And people go, Oh, well, you always say that. Well, I said, Well, <laughs> the reality is, this is what always pops up on someone's labs. And it's probably a good starting point for most people because what are the top eight foods that people eat every single day it is usually dairy, usually eggs. Corn is probably in everything that we possibly can buy, especially if you eat packaged food. Um, and then and you have gluten, which is pretty much everything what we grew up eating as kids into, you know, college and then into our adult life. It's, not to say that, you know, those are, those are all the evil foods, but my viewpoint is if you're going to start somewhere and you think that you're reactive, we'll just simply take them out and see how you respond. Mm -hmm. There's always an argument of, well, Rob, you know, you have to have dairy. I said, well, why do you have to have dairy? Well, it's a good protein source. Well, I, you've got 20 other protein sources over here. So that's not a really good argument. Oh, well, you need the, the vitamin D. Well, you'd have to get I don't know. I think it's like 50 IUs of 
vitamin D per glass per glass of milk, you have to drink like 20 glasses of milk to get <laughs> you vitamin D. And then the other argument is obviously calcium that some of the dietitians argue. And I say, well, if you eat enough vegetables and fruit, you can get enough calcium. You can get mm-hmm. calcium from sardines if you want to eat sardines. So there's no essential nutrient that you need from dairy. There's no essential nutrient you need from eggs because you can get the protein from other sources. There's no essential nutrient from corn. And there's definitely no essential nutrient from, from wheat. It's just most people have been educated to say, well, you need to eat wheat bread because that was, you know, the bottom tier of the food pyramid for so long, right? Yes. You know, I'm telling people, look, I'm not telling you to go no carb either. I'm just saying, get your carbs from some other source where you're not going to be reactive to. Because I just tell people, it's not the end all and be all of someone's hormonal health or their gut health or getting their liver you know, back to a healthier state, but food sensitivities, they're like that little pebble in the shoe. So we went hiking and we went to like Yosemite in in California and I took you hiking and we went through, I don't know, some dry riverbed and like some pebbles got in my shoe. I'm like, oh, it's like, screw it. I got some pebbles. I'll just go. It's too much a hassle. Take my my shoe off. Well, (laughs) eventually three miles, four miles in the road, I'm going to get a blister, right? And then the blister gets puffy and then it bursts and then it I'm rubbing my in my heat in my shoe and then I got a hobble, I get knee pain, I get hip pain, I get a little back pain. So it's sort of that pebble in the shoe that manifests into other problems um, down the road. And you know, we eat at minimum three times a day, probably for most people. So those are potential inflammatory foods that are being eaten on a daily basis, seven days a week. So if you take the irritants away, people typically they're like, oh wow, I didn't know what life was like without having those irritating eggs all the time, which I thought they were super healthy, you know? Now, don't get me wrong. Eggs are really, really healthy, but Mm -hmm. what overrides, you know, the great protein and some of the fats and choline and inositol you can get from eggs is if if your immune system is having a slight reaction. So that's where I should decipher between a sensitivity versus an allergy is that, you know, sensitivity, it's a sort of a gray area in the sense that, Sometimes it's the amount of food that's eaten um, and it's the frequency that impacts the food sensitivity. Whereas if someone has a peanut allergy, like you can have like a tiny sliver of the peanut and they're going to be Will Smith in the movie Hitch, right? His face blows up Mm -hmm. after (laughs) food, right? And he's sucking down Benadryl at the Rite Aid. So that people, most people know. But the other branches of your immune system, um, they're a slower reactor, so to speak. They're not like the Navy SEALs where they go out and blow up someone or, you know, kill a terrorist and come back, like have a beer, like nothing happened. This is like the army reserves where it takes a long time for these guys to mobilize. So typically people don't notice the effects hours, sometimes even days later. So that's where it can be kind of confusing with the sensitivity aspect of foods. Yeah. I went through that myself and I mourned the loss of garlic in my diet. I cannot (laughs) sadly have my favorite lasagna because I just have a sensitivity, but it's interesting, like every once in a while, like every 30 days, I can have like a little bit, but mm-hmm. it's just been like a balance to learn. And I think that it's changed me though, because just felt terrible all the time. But then would I rather, I love the taste of garlic and I love everything like garlic bread and lasagna and it's all just so good, but it's not worth it to me. So, and, and learning that really drove that home. So anyone that's, you know, the excuses that people have provided to you. Maybe if they're on the other side of feeling great, it would be a lot easier and they would they would know that. I always ask the last question of the podcast because we've talked, I've talked for way too long with you, Rob, <laughs> but one action item for our users that you think would change their health or in this case, energy today. If people could only do one thing in your opinion, what would it be? It is, well, it would be, I guess, a two-parter, but it'd be one is make it a goal to drink half your body ounces of water. So if you figure that out, obviously you're 200 pounds, you're drinking 100 ounces of water for the day. Or if you're based on the metric system, it's one liter per 30 kilos. But out of that, hands down, 25% of your intake first thing in the morning with some salt would make a massive difference in terms of energy for a lot of people. Because like I said before, you're waking up in a dehydrated state. So just getting water in the system and salt the electrolyte, uh, you're going to have less brain fog. So you're going to think clearer. So your perception is, I have more energy. I don't feel like I'm dragged down. And then the potential is, all right, my energy is better. 
I don't need more caffeine, which is only going to draw more fatigue to your system uh, later on and possibly affect your sleep. So it becomes this nice sort of a beneficial snowball effect, so to speak. So that would be my one recommendation is drink that 25% of your total intake first thing in the morning with some salt. And I almost guarantee you'll probably feel a bit better. Amazing. Where can our chronometer community find you? So they can find me a uh, website. If you need some help, consultations, speaking engagements, that sort of thing is simply robertyang.net. So R-O-B-E-R-T-Y-A-N-G.net. And then obviously on the socials, Robert Yang on Instagram. I think it's Robert Yang Inc. on Twitter and Facebook. So you can find me there as well. Amazing. And I will link all of those in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for being here. You've been a wealth of information that I'm going to go home and implement so I can ride my mountain bike to the best of my abilities. (laughs) My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Discovering Nutrition. We hope that you've learned so much from Rob. There's so much awesome information that can be taken away and applied into your own life so you can start feeling your best. If you like this episode, please make sure you subscribe and I can't wait to see you next time.